Well, good evening, everyone. Michael Soothing here. We're going to do something just a little bit different this evening. I won't be able, mostly, to be my normal comedic self because, but I'm still going to try to talk soothing to you. Because the nature of this video, I'll give you a disclaimer, could be a bit disturbing. It's the nature of the case. This is a true crime case. Recently in the news, and I had a request from Lauren to do the Chris Watts case. This happens to be a guy who strangled his pregnant wife and his two little girls. And so that's pretty serious uh, and disturbing. But the case has some twists and turns that you might find interesting to follow up on because it delves a bit into the psychopathic, sociopathic mindset and how that kind of mind develops, which in this case, as we'll see, isn't just about Chris Watts himself, but goes back to his mother and some of the supporting characters are contributory, I think. So, by the way, I want to say to um, those who have been giving me compliments, I truly appreciate your comments. I have um, people like Stephanie and Chargo and uh, Diana and Tracy and many others who I appreciate very much, Aaron. Um, and there are others who were complimentary and requested more true crime stories like this, such as Kitty and Aaron and Kelly and Sarah. So that's why we'll do something different. This will be a very long video because I've got to include a couple little clips of Chris Watts and a couple other people in order to give you a fuller picture, but there are dozens or hundreds of web links and videos you can go to if you want to know more about the case, and I'll include a handful of links down in the description, okay? So just for a bit of background, Chris Watts, who I believe was 33 at the time, committed these murders recently, just this last summer, August, all right? And his wife's name is Shanann, and she would have been 34 at the time. I'm going to have to sip water a lot, and I'm also going to make use of my computer tonight, which I don't normally do when I'm doing videos, as you know. Now, Shanann and Chris met in 2009, and um, he was a mechanic and she was in car sales. She had some medical history. Well, by the way, they had both been married one time before. Um, she had lupus, which is very serious, and therefore had to avoid gluten. Um, they had a very nice house that her family was in the contracting business. She had built, not personally built, but had it built. Um, and they had from an outsider's perspective, the perfect happy home, um, as they had their children and all. Um, Shanann got pregnant, and uh, well, first they had the two girls, Celeste and Bella, who at the time their father murdered them, no 
gentle way to put it, they were three year old and four years old. But in spite of very difficult, complicated pregnancies and many health issues with both girls, uh, many surgeries, a couple hundred thousand dollars in out-of-pocket medical bills which sent them into bankruptcy, Chris Watts wanted Shanann to get pregnant again because he wanted a boy, all right? So she decided to go ahead and try on his behalf. Um, I'm going to give you the timeline and tell you, for example, kind of how things unfolded starting in June of last year. On June 11th, Shanann gets pregnant, or she is pregnant, and Chris seems excited. You can look up the clips where he's all happy she's pregnant. Uh, Three days later, little Bella, um, their daughter Bella, four years old, sings to her father. And um, on that very same day, Chris starts putting pictures from his new mistress into his phone. Contact with his mistress, I should say. Not pictures yet. And his mistress name is Nicole Kessinger. I'll try to remember to put a photo of her up. Moving on a few days, this is all in 2018, okay, June. Moving to the 17th of June, Shanann, his wife, writes a tribute to Chris on Father's Day, and she says things like, she was brave enough to agree to number three, that is, getting pregnant, because Chris is such a great father and great guy. Let me scroll down on the computer timeline I have, which I will link so you can follow this if you'd like, um, and see the video clips that I'm talking about. Where are we on the 17th? Uh, Shannon writes a tribute to him on Facebook. Chris, we are so incredibly blessed to have you, she wrote. You do so much every day for us and take such great care of us. You are the reason I was brave enough to agree to number three. All right. Then she shares a few day, couple days later a picture of the little boy she's carrying, Chris's son, who was also killed by him when he strangled Shanann. June 27th. Later in the month, Shanann takes the two daughters to North Carolina for a five-week vacation with their family, and they see both Chris's parents um, and Shanann's parents. Now, mind you, we're going to delve into Chris's parents and how vile and horrible those two individuals are particularly the mother. And you'll see a little bit of how a monster like Chris in sheep's clothing might have developed. As soon as she takes off for North Carolina, Chris starts a torrid affair with, um, what's his, Nicole Kessinger. And um, his wife, Shanann, immediately sees a shift in him. Suddenly, he doesn't want to talk on the phone or text or have any contact, and he gets cold and distant. Um, by the 14th of July, let me scroll down on my timeline. Oh, let me tell you the signs of tension are beginning to show. 
in the Watts marriage. And here's text messages from the 10th of July, just a week after he started this affair, basically. Shannon says to him, are you okay? It's like you don't want to talk anymore. I keep trying to talk and I have to dig things out of you. Watts replied, Chris Watts, I'm fine, baby. The last few days at work have put a lot of responsibility on me and with new people. I didn't mean to seem short, boo. Guess that's her nickname. I love you to the moon and back. Shannon responded, I miss you, but I feel like you just want to work out and run away. Watts claimed running helped him clear his head. Shannon didn't buy the excuse, she said. I wish my husband wanted to talk to me. Four days later, Chris Watts is taking Ms. Kessinger on a date to a car museum in town, in Boulder, Colorado, by the way, is where they live. And four days after that, Nicole Kessinger, his mistress, starts sending him semi-nude photos of herself, which he starts storing in a secret app on his phone. Hey, Joanne. I promise you I don't have a secret app on my phone, okay? Um, on the 30th of July, I'm not going to show you photos of all this stuff, but you can look it up for yourself if you're interested. I'm going to post this timeline with the pictorials, okay? On the 30th of July, about one month into this affair, Chris leaves for his wife's final week in North Carolina. He's going to join her and his two daughters. So he leaves on the 30th, um, and he leaves a love letter for Nicole Kessinger. A schmaltzy thing, I'm looking at it now. A kiss, a touch, a smile, a squeeze. By the way, like many of sociopaths, this guy doesn't understand human empathy or emotions. So he was busy doing Google searches on when is it appropriate to say I love you in a new relationship? How do you express yourself? Blah, blah, blah. He had many how-to things because he doesn't know these things. Um innately, you know. Anyway, he goes for the final week in North Carolina, flies from Colorado to there, and promptly starts to totally ignore his wife and daughters and act bizarre, distant, remote, silent. Um, and some things happen during this visit which I'll go into when I start discussing his mother, uh, Chris Watts' mother. She does some very bizarre things, like that shows how vile and evil she is, and that he didn't fall far from the tree. For example, um, she knows that her two granddaughters are extremely, they have asthma, and a severe asthma, and some severe, potentially fatal allergies to tree nuts. So Shanann had asked her, please don't feed them anything with nuts. So she promptly gives them ice cream with nuts in it, um, because she's always trying to just do everything she can to poke at Shanann. When Shanann sees that, she says, does that ice cream have nuts? I explained to you this could be deadly to them. And the grandmother, you know, Chris's mom gets all angry. 
So they take the ice cream away. Shinan goes outside with the daughters to play with their uh, Chris's sister, the aunt. She comes back in five minutes later and there's a big serving bowl of peanuts on the table that wasn't there before. Now, this could kill these children with anaphylactic shock if you know anything about severe allergies, like a severe fish allergy can do the same thing, by the way. I know about that. That shows you what kind of grandma, what kind of mother Chris Watts comes from. I'll go into more about her later. Meanwhile, as Chris is away for that final week with his family in body but not in mind, his mistress, Nicole, is searching the internet for wedding dresses and um, things along that line. Also, she was doing research on how to have how to do something she hadn't done before at his request. How can I put this and not be flat? Let's just say it had something to do with rear and intimacy um, involving, say, multiple people. Okay, now that's all I'm going to say about that. Again, you can do your own research. I'm not going to tell you things like that. On the 7th of August now, still visiting in North Carolina, Shanann starts confiding to her friends how concerned she is about her marriage, how it's suddenly taking a horrible turn for the worst. Um, there are some text messages where Shanann was quite upset with Chris because when she told him about the peanut bowl incident, instead of backing her up, he did absolutely nothing. He didn't care, all right? So here's part of her text message on August 4th where she says, um, you can believe I created this dagger, but I didn't do that. I stood up for our kids and advocated to protect them. I don't ever want to hear, I'm sorry I killed your children because I was stupid. These kids are my world and I have to protect them from the evil in the world. And by evil she means their grandmother and with good reason. Our kids deserve the same love and attention other kids have nothing less. I'm not accepting I'm sorry from your mom because she doesn't mean it and she knew exactly what she was doing. I made it very clear to her about the allergies, etc. And she goes on about it. So, and then she talks about her problem pregnancy and getting no support from her husband. Then there was a fight with her in-laws. And now we're on to August 7th, a couple days later. She starts confiding to her friends, finally, about the problems with her husband, Chris. Chris told me he's scared to death about this third baby. He's happy with just Bella and Celeste and doesn't want another baby. Mind you, he's the one who told her to get pregnant again and have a boy, even though it was very high risk for her and she didn't want to. You see the sudden shift, right? He wants no responsibility anymore with this family or her, just like that. And the blink of an eye. He has changed. I don't know who he is now. Boy, I wish she would have left him. I really do. He hasn't touched me or kissed me or talked to me. 
um, he's cold. Addy, I have no idea what happened. Um, this is out of left field. He said he's not sitting on any couch saying what he just said to me. Uh, let's see, I don't understand that part of the text. Anyway, um, on August 9th, a couple days later, Shanann cancels a planned gender reveal party to celebrate that they're having a baby boy that Chris wanted because Chris suddenly wants nothing to do with her or the baby and he's being stone cold. Now they go on a business trip. Uh, she goes on a business trip and while she's gone Chris starts texting her and saying he's fallen out of love or as he put it strangely out of compatibility with her okay uh, let's see well Shanann has gone on this business trip Chris of course starts dating Nicole again Kessinger takes her to the lazy dog restaurant should have taken her to the dirty dog restaurant now Shanann Here's where the bad part comes in. I'm not going to dwell on this very much because it's just too disturbing to me. Instead, I'm going to look at more of the peripheral issues about the sick sociopathic mind, but I'll give you the basic facts, okay? Shanann returns home at, from her business trip, and she's with her friend, another girl named Nicole, they return at 1.48 a.m. in the morning on the 13th. About four hours later, less than that, Chris backs his uh, big SUV truck up to his garage and starts loading stuff which he'd never done before, by the way, because his neighbor has a surveillance video uh, recorded of everything that happens on the block. And when they reviewed that surveillance footage, they see this is the first time he leaves with the truck, which happens to have his dead wife now and children in it, and then, um, after he strangles his wife and daughters, by the way, he starts looking up song lyrics on his phone to the Metallica song, Battery, which is lyrics that intimate killing your family. After this, he does some very strange things. Uh, well, first of all, okay, we know he took his wife out into the oil fields where he works, buried her in a shallow grave, dumped his two daughters into two empty oil tanks, which he later admitted to, by the way. After that, later in the morning, after doing all that, he calls up their new school and says, Oh, my daughters won't be enrolling after all. Uh, this is before his family's even been reported missing, all right? Or it's around the same time frame. Very strange. At 12.27, that same day, just after noon, he starts having a long conversation with his realtor about selling his house and doesn't even mention anything about his wife and daughters. Um, other than later on, the realtor says, this is way into the conversation, the realtor says, what does Shanann think about all this? 
and he nonchalantly says, Oh, uh, she took off and disappeared with the kids. It's a little strange. I should read you some of the text of the, uh, the text exchange. Um, if I can find it further down, let's see, there's the date with the, with the dirty dog, the big dog, whatever, some kind of dog. And then after disposing of the bodies, he does the Metallica thing. Here's the realtor texting. Hi, I'm working on your market analysis, etc., etc. Uh, have you done any other upgrades? And he starts carrying a normal conversation with her. You know, oh, the basement's still unfinished. I haven't done other upgrades. They go back and forth and all these messages for quite some time. And after a long time has elapsed, the realtor asks, about why Shanann hasn't weighed in on any of this stuff. And Chris says, Oh, she hasn't been around all day. It's very odd. And the realtor says, Wow, that's really weird. You must really be worried. Have you checked with her friends or called and reported her missing? And he says, Oh, I've done all that. Police are handling it now. OMG, she says. I'm sorry. Lots of prayers. Okay. Now, mind you, this is before uh, the cops have been called. Because about an hour later, more than an hour later, is when Shanann's friend, Nicole Atkinson, comes to the house. She's worried about Shanann because she knows Shanann had a morning doctor appointment for her pregnancy and did not show up and is not responding to any text or email. So she goes to the house, no one coming to the door when she rings and knocks. She looks into the little windows in the garage and sees that Shanann's car is there. So now she's really worried. She calls Chris. He tells her not to worry about it and to leave, right? Does that sound normal to you? How do people think they're going to get away with something like this? Unless their mind is just so narcissistic that they think no one will question what they do. I don't understand. I think I'm going to show you, I'm going to make a note to myself here to show you at this point the video footage a little bit of what Chris says and does when they find that his wife and daughters are missing, of course. He knows where they are. And he says weird things like, Instead of calling them by name, he says, uh, when he's claiming not to know what happened to them, and he's being interviewed by a television station, he says, I need to see everyone again. Not, oh, this is horrible. I don't know where my wife and daughters are, but I need to see everyone again. I'm going to pause here for a moment and then we'll talk about Chris's mother and some more things that happened. Now here, you know that Chris knows he strangled and dumped his girls in an oil tank, but listen to how smoothly he speaks about where they are or are not. I have no idea like where they went. And it doesn't, if this earth shattering, I don't feel like this is even real right now. Here you're going to see one of the most bizarre statements ever. But knowing he's guilty, then you'll understand better how sociopathic this guy is. Notice that he talks about his 
wife and children in the third person as people, everybody, instead of by name. As this progresses, check this out. I'm, I'm hoping that somebody sees something or somebody knows something and comes forward. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. This house is not complete with without anybody here. Here we have Chris Watts' fidgety reaction to being caught in the lie that his wife left after him with the two children. Uh, it turns out his neighbor's surveillance camera would have caught that and she never left after him. She left with him, which the neighbor's camera shows him loading stuff into the back of his truck, leaving and no one else leaving after that. Quite interesting. Let's look at his weird reactions when he's caught in his lies. That's why I heard friends said it was low blood sugar. Low blood sugar. He's talking about his wife's diabetes. Look how he's getting on his cell phone. We believe he's texting his uh, mistress at this point to avoid talking to the neighbor or the cop who's right now asking him questions. He's not showing concern about his wife and daughters at all. Instead, he's distracting himself so he doesn't have to make eye contact. So where are we? I want to finish the timeline. Then we'll talk about a couple of the peripheral people in this case, but they're more than peripheral since they're a key to what happened in some ways. So anyway, now we're up to the 15th of August after Chris Watts has denied knowing anything about what happened to his family after he's been caught in a lie by saying they left the house to go on a play date after he left for work but the neighbor's surveillance video shows only he left and they didn't not in their car anyway um, he is brought in to be questioned by the police finally after he gives a couple interviews which clips we have now I think viewed if I do my editing correctly so after he goes through a few hours of claiming you know you know everything's fine no I don't have any involvement with anyone else oh wait maybe things aren't so fine we were having marital troubles oh wait you guys know I was having an affair okay then I'll cop to that but of course I don't know anything about my wife and daughter's disappearance here we see Chris using the word like far too many times in his sentences and that should be cause alone for the death penalty not to make light of what he actually did. Morning, or late that morning. So like the disconnection is it's there. Like it's not going away. Like the connection we had in the beginning mm -hmm. it's not there anymore. It's like I don't feel like the love we have is there anymore. Okay. And it's just like I don't feel like I mean, if we want to stay together for the kids, I'm not sure if that's going to work. Mm -hmm. Like bringing another baby to one, yes, okay. Like having another baby and bringing into this relationship, do you think this is going to work mm -hmm. with us being together? Keep in mind, he's the one who asked her to have another baby, even though it would be extremely dangerous for her to do so, given her medical history of troubled pregnancies and lupus. Um, after all that, he agrees to a lie detector test. So the following morning, he comes in for the test and um, he fails miserably. Now, of course, you and I know 
my detector tests are not admissible as evidence in most states most of the time. Maybe it's all states. In any case, sociopaths always think they can talk their way and lie their way out of anything, so they're always shocked when they fail the lie detector test. But this one looked like it was done pretty well. I watched how it was done, the video of it, and they do control questions where the person answers truthfully to establish a baseline galvanic skin response. Then they have the person tell specific kinds of lies and that will show a higher response, galvanic skin response, etc., heart rate, etc. But that might only be double the amplitude of, say, a truth statement. But when they, so after they establish those two tiers of baselines, intentional truth statements and intentional lie statements, then they go to the real questions. And if the person is being deceptive on those and doesn't know how to defeat the polygraph, it goes like way up the scale, even much higher in amplitude than the intentional lie statements were. Because now they know this is what matters, all right? So anyway, they did that and he failed miserably on all the questions relating to his wife and daughters. Once they had him on that, they have his, they're pressing him in the interview. There's hours of footage you can go to on the internet if you're interested. Um, his father comes in, didn't want his mom. Father comes in, he admits to his dad that he strangled his wife, right? And uh, so then he admits to the detectives that, oh, we had a fight. But then he tells a bizarre story, uh, once again, unable to cop to what he did fully. He says that his wife strangled their two daughters and he strangled her in a fit of rage uh, because she killed the daughters. Well, of course, they know that's a false story. It goes against everything they know by now about his wife. So they continue to press and interview and interrogate and eventually he cops to all of it. And he agrees to plead guilty in court in order to get a life sentence instead of the death penalty. So then he tells them where his wife and daughters are. And he nonchalantly talks about their interviewing him about his daughters, for example, and they say, we're out at those oil tanks and the hole is small. Where the um, hole is at the top, are you sure you got your daughters in there? And he says, yes. And they say, how did you do it? Head first or feet first? Okay, I know this is disturbing. I told you earlier, it disturbs me. I'm going to have nightmares anyway. He nonchalantly says, oh, feet first. Uh, I mean, at this point, you know, the guy has no conscience whatsoever. He is ashamed, you'll see later, but I think his shame may be more associated with getting caught and how he knows people view him now rather than ashamed about the acts themselves. In any case, um, he's given life without parole in his trial. But let's talk a little bit now 
about his mistress, Nicole Kessinger. Um, I don't think she's such a high quality person either. And I think she is, of course, in some ways the motive for why he committed this crime, although she could never be blamed for it, of course. It's 100% his evil act, and I don't believe she encouraged or participated in any way, and they have all of her messages and texts, so she didn't tell him, oh, if you didn't have a wife and children, you know, Though she did say, you know, you need to be divorced and on your own. But what was she up to all this time? Well, she was preparing to indulge his particular uh, taste, shall we say, in things she hadn't done before, involving, say, rear-end activity and um, other things, which I won't go into. She was um, searching on the internet to find him an apartment, encouraging him to get divorced quickly and how fast his house was going to sell. She was erasing, once he was caught, she was erasing everything on her phone so as not to herself be suspected of anything. Maybe that's natural, maybe it isn't. But she was caught in some lies with the police interrogation. For example, she told the cops that she met Chris Watts for the first time, uh, or she first started um, having an interest in him in, I believe, June of 2018, when our timeline begins. We don't know exactly what started the relationship, her or him, but here's an interesting note. She, it turns out, was searching on his name on Google, but not just his name, even though she claimed that at f when she was interrogated by the police, she said, oh, he didn't have a wedding ring on, I had no idea he had a wife and kids when we first started up in June 2018. It turns out, however, she was searching almost a year earlier on Google, not only on Chris, um, not only on Chris Watts, but on his wife, Shanann Watts. She knew he was married almost a year earlier, and she was searching for Shanann's Facebook page and other things because she wanted to do a little research before she started to hit on that guy, okay? I don't find her completely innocent of all wrongdoing in this. Then, of course, she starts up this affair with someone she now knows is a married guy, with two children and she's doing all she can to pull him in sending it turns out sending him many many risque photos of herself which he was putting into an, a secret app and trying to find him an apartment so he would get out of his house with his family things like that what else do we know about her? Oh, also, after he's caught and confesses, which of course happens just like three days after the murder, um, two or three days, two days really, um, she starts searching the internet about what how did the public handle the mistress in the Scott and Lacey Peterson case. Remember, Scott Peterson killed his pregnant wife because he wanted to be with his mistress, Amber Fry. So she searched on, 
did people dislike Amber Fry, the mistress? But worse than that, she searched on, how much did Amber Fry get paid for her book about being with Scott Peterson? Okay, so this is a girl who, and if you watch the clips of her being interviewed, I'm going to include one here at this point. You'll see that she's an empty, vapid person who says like all the time. Cole Kessinger, the mistress, um, explaining why she deleted everything on her phone to try to hide her relationship with this family killer. And uh, when you listen to her demeanor, um, I don't think she was involved in the crime, but her voice is so far removed from ASMR that I think I'll have to mute it down a lot or you'll all be convicting me of a crime for including this in an ASMR video. Let's see what she's saying, trying to explain whether or not she wanted him to not have his kids. And it wasn't because I had any problems. You have to look at it from the perspective that I'm looking at it. Yeah. And how it could be misconstrued or made out to sound something another way. That's why I wanted to give you the opportunity to say what it really means. Okay? No, I don't mean any harm towards those kids. I always thought they were so cute when he showed me those pictures. He was all about them. You know, and not only that, it's like once you guys get those texts, you will see like there's not very much mention of his children. And if there is mention of his children, it's always like cute stuff where it's like, hey, I should show them this, or hey, this apartment's great for them, or you know, what do you think about beds? And you know, like, they, those little girls like remind me of me and my little sister. They're like the same age. Right. Yeah, I mean, like it was so cute. Like he would call it. Don't you think she's talking way too much and way too fast? and way too cheerful about the two little girls that her lover just murdered. Um, she isn't involved in the crime, but she is an empty, vacuous, valley girl airhead, I'm afraid I have to say. She's, she's like saying like, like every other, like every other sentence, like, um, well, like her lover, Chris Watts, they're both like empty, cliche, shallow, you know, type people, okay? So let me just say, anyway, sorry to make light, but I have to inject something into this to keep my head from exploding. Now, how about the psycho mom of Chris Watts, who, uh, you know, mated with um, Beelzebub and um, the Incubus? You know how jo I would always say Jody Arias is the succubus? Well, uh, she should get together with the Incubus, and which is Chris Watts. But before that, the incubus mated with his mother, and that's how he came to be. Anyway, Chris and his father are obviously both passive type B personalities under the thumb, under the thumb of the type A mother-in-law, mother from hell, Cindy Watts. Okay. okay. Uh, Cindy, if you do the backstory, you'll find that Cindy hated Shanann from the very start because nobody was going to be with her little boy and say anything, especially if it involved her. You know, like you're not going to tell me whether or not I can poison my grandchildren with peanuts, okay? Um, the first time that 
Chris Watts' mother met Shanann's mother, um, Cindy, his uh, Chris mother, said, Oh, I just don't see this relationship. By the way, hasn't your daughter been married before? To which uh, Shanann's mom said, Yeah, just like your son's been married before. Anyway, you see in all the dialogue, and even after the murders, she doesn't have the slightest remorse for either her daughter or her step um, daughter-in-law or her own grandchildren. Um, she's as cold and evil and vile as her son. In fact, I think she was really quite glad about it. Um, that's how horrid a person she is, but I'm sorry to get off on this tangent. I'm just incredibly frustrated that these kind of individuals live and breathe among us. There are many of them, though. I will do more videos in the future from time to time when I can stand it, okay? Because you know I've always been fascinated with the law and legal cases. But anyway, what else did the mother of Chris do? for example, to show her character. Well, when they were going to have their engagement party, uh, Chris and Shanann, the mother wanted to handle the invitations. So she had uh, Shanann give all the invitations to um, Cindy's daughter, Jamie, Chris's sister and said, oh, we'll take care of those 80 invitations, right, for you. You know, we're being kind and all. So she gave him all the invitations, trying to, you know, play ball. Although there was a red flag popping up for Shanann. Rightly so, it turns out, nobody came except the parents and the sister. So Shanann was devastated. Why would no one show up? So she starts calling the people who were invited, and they said, We never got an invitation. That mother, future mother-in-law, had thrown all of the 80 invitations into the trash, okay? This is what kind of evil witch she is, all right? And that's only her good qualities. Um, when they had their wedding, Chris's mother and none of the family on Chris's side came to the wedding, except for an uncle and a grandmother. But Cindy, the witch from hell, saw to it that nobody else would show up. Not Chris's sister, not the weak, passive father who was under Cindy, evil mother from hell's thumb, no one. Um, Shanann, by the way, um, saved Chris's life at one point. Not that he or his mother would ever credit her for it. She noticed something peculiar on his uh, nether regions. Turned out it was cancer, and he didn't want to go to the doctor, but she pressed on the issue, and he went, and he got treated and cured, and he would have been dead otherwise, okay? It's too bad it didn't work out that way. Um, when Shannon was pregnant with Cel and Celeste, her parents moved from North Carolina and spent 15 months with her in Colorado to help her. Um, during that time, sold everything they had other than their home back in North Carolina. Um, and when Cindy, the evil mother of Chris, came to visit, she cloistered the children away from uh, Shanann's mom and refused to let her even see them 
which was very strange. Um, and then she started screaming at Shanann's mom. So that ended any discussion or talking between them. Um, yeah. What else can we say about the mother? Well, I think enough has been said other than she was constantly trying to interfere and um, turn her son against his wife. And this may have subconsciously or consciously planted a seed in his mind to rationalize why it was okay to kill her and his children. Since we're talking about warped and twisted minds, I just wanted to take a divergent aside from the horror of this crime and talk about these bizarre people. Just like in the Jody Arias trial, where she suddenly had a thousand guys who wanted to be her boyfriend after she was known to have stabbed um, Travis 39 times and slit his throat. Here we have, now that we know Chris Watts kills his wife and two baby girls, we have all these women who say things like, um, I want to get to know you so bad it's not even funny. Well, she's right about that. It's definitely not even funny. Um, but my heart, little heart insignia, I truly want to change. We don't know one another, but in my heart, I truly want that to change. Please, please, please add me to your visitation life and trust me you will not be sorry can we be pen pals where do these warped people come from if we go along a little further i think we have another one. Oh yes here we are uh, this is a different girl trust me when i say this i do not care what happened or whatever the or whatever is, you know, that you strangled your wife and your unborn child to death and your two daughters, okay? But I really do care about you with happy smiley face. This is someone she doesn't know at all, of course. Where do all these sick people come from, folks? This, uh... This investigation is taking a piece out of my heart and soul. It just goes to show um, how these kind of people are created both by genetic uh, background and by the example they see, both nature and nurture. What can we say about this in conclusion? Um, I'll show you a clip of one of the daughters because it's heartbreaking. I'm going to include this clip at the end even though it disturbed me a great deal because I believe that the more people who despise this Chris Watts exist in the world the better off the world will be. This was his daughter, Bella, singing to her father shortly before he strangled her to death. after that, what Chris did to his daughters. Um, that one fought back, by the way, so what horror must she have experienced knowing what her father was doing? 
um, I can't even hardly speak when I think about it, but if there's any consolation, it's, um, it's knowing two things. One is, as I mentioned in the Jody Arias case, um, justice will always be done in the long run, whether in this life or the next. But also, I think, in Chris Watt's case, he's in jail for life. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if his life in jail was a short one. Not only did he lose all the trappings of what mattered to him, which was all the things that were for show on the surface, including the mistress. Um, apparently his motive for the murder had to do with his rear-end proclivities. I can't see much else. There were other things, of course, um, his mother and other things that were a factor. But you know, in jail, um, there's a lot of violent felons, and if they can get their hands on a child killer, they make short work of them. Uh, barring that, someone like Chris Watts will often take their own life even if they are a narcissistic sociopath. Interestingly, he did confess to the crime, which is more than we can say for Jody Arias, for example. Uh, but as to whether he really has genuine remorse, who knows? He uh, sobs and shows holds his head down in shame in court and in jail now days but is that sadness and shame over what he did or is it over the fact that he was caught and everyone now knows what he did um, I think it's the second why can't I get these cars to be quiet I think it's the second because when you go through a lot of the transcripts of what he says in his past, which I watched video clips of family life and other things he said, it's always about like, um, oh, I said like in a place where it, which drives me insane. Uh, he's constantly looking for approval of how things look. Uh, how will this look to others? You'll see that over and over. That was what was important to him rather than the substance of his family. So, you know, anyway, I can't say much else other than um, I feel like I have to take not one but six showers to wash Chris Watts and his mother off myself and out of my mind. I actually had a nightmare about it last night when I was doing my research. See what I go through for my subbies. Anyway, next time we'll return with a lighter subject matter and um, a more relaxing ASMR topic. All right, everyone. Um, hopefully you got to sleep before the most disturbing aspects of this video. Um, but if not, I hope that at least the synopsis of it that I gave you will spare you from uh, having to delve too deeply into some of the more disturbing parts of it yourself. Take care, everyone. Don't ASMR and drive. All right? Bye-bye.